Good evening, afternoon. This is a different weekday evening live stream. Sorry I missed Saturday. I was uh, in transit, actually. But, uh, and then yesterday, my whole studio was dish like not even connected because I had torn apart a bunch of gear. So um, I figured today would be better. Hello, how is everybody? Ariel Posen's here as well as some of my friends in uh, Australia, right? Did I see uh, a Gabor? Yeah, super fun, awesome, happy time pedal show. This is a much better time. Well, like I said at the beginning of the year, I think I, I said I wanted to try to do like one midweek evening stream. Uh, so maybe this will be the start of it. But um, who else is here? Anthony Martinez, Mr. James, Steve was here early. Uh, hello from Austin, Eric Salzman. Matt Harrison is here. Ben Tom? No. Matt Harrison, you might be the lone uh, moderator today. Welcome. Aaron Albasban is here. I need to make you a moderator, Aaron. Um, yeah, okay, so it's Wednesday morning in Australia on that side of the world. Okay, this works. Junard Galano, good morning from the Philippines. So, I will tell you right now that I did not take any vlog, video vlog of my crazy... It was a crazy week. Uh, and I'm going to tell you all about it and show you some photos and video that other people took. So I didn't take a vlog. And the main reason why I didn't bring a camera and vlog the whole process was because... I was, it's not my gig, I'm subbing on a gig, and the the number one rule for being a sideman or, um, you know, doing the, these types of gigs is respect the artist's privacy. Respect the artist that you're working with and their privacy. I didn't even bother, I mean, if I asked to say, hey man, can I like take video of, you know, sound checks and, and backstage things and, and all that stuff, I'm sure... Uh, it would have been fine, but I didn't even want to go down that route. Plus, it's... I was already dealing with so much more stuff. Um, ben Coombs is here. All right, we can begin now. Uh, but, um... So how do I start this? So if you didn't know, last weekend I had to leave town um, kind of for like an emergency gig. I was playing with a, a singer named Corey Taylor. Uh, who, if you don't know Corey Taylor, he's he's in a bunch of different bands, but he's most known for singing in Slipknot and Stone Sour. He's got his solo project, so it's totally different than those two other bands. Uh, he also does a bunch of cameo appearances in other people's songs, and he's all he's an all-around good guy. I don't really have a you know I don't have a photo of him just yet, but anyways, he's on this pass. Um, so. Here's how it went down. Are you ready? Late Sunday night, I got a text uh, while I was sleeping from my friend Christian Martucci. Christian Martucci is um, the, one of the guitarists in Stone Sour, which is one of Corey's bands, but he also plays in Corey's solo project. He called, he texted me while I was sleeping like midnight or something on a Sunday. He said, uh, something regarding, like, uh, kind of have a, a slight emergency. And when I woke up the next morning on Monday, I obviously knew what it was regarding. Um, so I texted him back and we went, uh, he told me what was going down and basically their normal guitar player got sick and couldn't make these shows that they had on Thursday and Friday. So this was Monday where I got notified um shows were thursday friday i would have had i had to leave on wednesday wednesday morning to go to minneapolis to do like a run through a rehearsal before doing the shows on thursday and friday so i had a i had it technically a day and a half half of monday and tuesday to learn the songs prepare when it came down to it, I basically had a day to learn the songs because the other half of the day I had to 
get my gear together uh, and pack and get my brain right and, and prepare for this, this week. So, um, a day to learn a 16 song set. Is it 16 songs? Let me see. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve, thirteen, four, fourteen. No, wait a second. Fourteen, fifteen, six. No, that was sixteen. I don't know why they put them all on the same line. Sixteen song set to learn in one day. Um, so that was a high stress situation, but you know, I figured I could do it. I think I've probably done something uh, close to that in the past. Um, I got lucky because half of the set were stone si not half of the set, but I'll show you the set list in a second. I, uh, one, two, three, four, five, six, six songs of the set were stone sour songs that I had previously learned. So, um, I will preface this for anyone that doesn't know in 2018, I got called to sub on stone sour for two weeks. So that's how I know um, the guys in Stone Sour. That's how I know Corey. I should go way back. So, cause you're probably wondering how did I get the gig and all this stuff? How did I, how do I know Corey Taylor and how do I, how did I get all this stuff? So Christian Martucci, the other guitar player, him and I go way back. We've known each other since we both, when we both lived in LA like 10, 12 years ago. So, He's been a friend of mine, you know, we nerd about, nerd out about guitar gear and everything. So good friend of mine. So he knows, he knows me, he knows my personality and he knows how I play and, and my capabilities and all that stuff. So basically that's the connection. So 2018, I, I toured with Stone Sour. So I knew already six songs. Um, and then another one was a cover which was easy to learn of a, a, a song which I'll show you in, in a second. So really I only had to learn like half the set, um, maybe 10 songs or something. So it was a little bit easier than I thought. And luckily the songs that I had learned and the songs that are on Corey Taylor's newest um, solo album are not as, um, technical and difficult to learn as like, say, Slipknot stuff or even Stone Sour stuff. They're more, you know, they're very rock and roll, uh, a little more pop, but it's almost like, you know, there's pop punk, there's elements of pop punk, there's elements of 70s rock, Kiss. So the arrangements were easy to, to remember and get in my head. <laughs> no, I'm not the new bass player from, who is the ba new bassist for Megadeth? Um, I know, uh, the bassist from Suicidal Tendencies is playing with Korn. I think it was his first gig this past week. Um, but anyway, so <clears throat> a couple years ago, I did a video on how I learned songs for gigs. No, I think it was like, how do I prepare for gigs, which I can't throw up a link, but if, if uh, Ben Coombs wants to search for that video and, and link it in the, the chat, I basically use that same method to prepare for this gig. And that's basically step one is to listen to all the songs first before picking up the guitar for it, before even messing around with gear or, or playing the guitar. I just listened to the songs over and over again. So what I did was they sent me the set list. Um, and I made, they sent me a set list and they sent me a video of one of their live performances so I could see what was going on live. Because, you know, sometimes that can be different than what's on the recording. But anyways, they sent me the set list. I went on my Spotify account and created a playlist in the order of the set. So that way I could just listen to it in the order of how I was going to be playing it. Because that, for me, helps a lot remembering what comes next or how, you know, all the different things that happen in between songs or when I have to change to a different tune guitar and all that stuff. So I made a playlist. I basically listened to it twice and then I got into learning the songs. And I apologize if I'm missing some of your chats because um, 
I'm list my iPad is about to run out of battery. Yeah, man. Christian Martucci. Tooch as they call him. <clears throat> amazing guy, amazing guitarist, fun hang. Um, so camera two. This was the set list that I was emailed, and these are the notes that I made for the set list. And I'll show you actually, I made out charts, but this is kind of what I write out uh, for my own sake. So these, some of you might know these songs if you're a fan of Corey Taylor's solo thing. Some of you might know these songs if you know uh, some Stone Sour stuff. Uh, Snuff was the only Slipknot song that I had to learn. That's like a ballad, um, four chords. So it really was easy to re remember, thankfully. <laughs> I'm glad I didn't have to learn, you know, people equal shit or something. But um, um, so this was the order of the songs and all this stuff in parentheses, we had Pyro uh, in the second show, which was the festival show. So, I guess I, I digress. So, um, Monday afternoon and Tuesday, I had to learn the songs. I had to pack, get my pedal board ready, which I'll show you in a second, get my gears restrung up with different gauges of strings because there's two tunings that we were using, an E flat and then a dr um, low C sharp, like Black Sabbath C sharp. Um, and then Wednesday I had like a one run through rehearsal and then Thursday was a show in Milwaukee and then Friday was a festival show in Kadat, Wisconsin, Rockfest, home on Saturday. Short run, but extremely, you know, high pressure, very high pressure situation, if you can imagine. Um, so Monday, Tuesday... I learned the songs, <clears throat> where was I here? So on the set list that they sent me, this was, the stuff was, um, there was pyro in the set, so this was just for the uh, the pyro people or the lighting or whoever. As a warning, this is when we're going to blow stuff up. I didn't have to worry about that. But, um, so this these were notes that I scratched after I had learned all of the songs and went through it. And I'll show you exactly what I did. So, you know, for some country stuff, pop stuff, I usually write in the Nashville number system, which is just, you know, um, Arabic numbers, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, all that stuff. For this uh, gig, I didn't have to do that, and it was actually just easier to write out full chords. So, this was my little notebook of, of chord charts that I used <clears throat> just to write it out and because I had to memorize it. There was no, I couldn't, you know, I, I'm, you shouldn't read a chart on a rock gig like this. It's just, you know, nerdy. So you just got to memorize it as best you could. Um, so I basically wrote out charts for the songs I didn't know, um, which was, you know, a good 10 of them. <clears throat> and... You know, don't go by what I how I write out my charts. This is all just kind of for my for my purposes. Um, you know, looking at some of this stuff, you might not even uh, get what this stuff means to me, just because it's just for me to remember. It's you know, it was a quick way to, for me to remember. Like these dots on E were just kind of hits, and then where I put down licks, that was my way of remembering to just noodle for a little bit until CT, Corey Taylor, plays that, you know, progression. <clears throat> so it wasn't like a very, it's not a very detailed, you know, I didn't write out tabs or I didn't, I didn't write out riffs. I just said, this is where the s signature riff is played. So just remember what that is. I had to remember what riff went with where. So it was just kind of more of a map, a visual map, uh, just to get me through the song. And something that I discovered is when I wrote these out, it was easier to remember the songs, the arrangements, because I think I would actually visualize the chart in my head. Like I would, I would visualize certain sections that I wrote out like, oh, here's, you know, Christian solo. And then we go into the harmonies 
And I would just kind of visualize this, how I wrote it out, um, so I knew when to come in for things. But, um, like, I didn't write out any specific rhythms necessarily. It was like a really basic roadmap. So once I did all of this stuff, you know, well, here was kind of like a reminder riff, <clears throat> kind of like a tab. Like, these are the frets that my fingers go on. This was a drop C sharp. So that's basically, you know, half step down, E flat guitar, and then you drop D that. Um, so after I wrote that all out and kind of played around with it, played along with the, uh, the, the Spotify playlist, then I would go into the, the set list and just kind of mark important things or things that I tended to forget about just as like notes, like specifically like what songs did I have to take a solo in or, you know, did I take the first solo? Do I take the second solo? Stuff like that. Um, I think I probably put asterisks around this one because I was like, don't F up this solo because it's very important. <clears throat> and luckily, so the other guitarist, his name is Zach Throne, and he also recorded on the record. Luckily, his solos were memorable um, because I was, I'm really bad about copying guitar solos. A lot of times on country gigs or whatever, I will just play, I will improvise and play whatever I feel. But his solos were easy to remember. Maybe I was just under like the pressure. Gerbs. I want to say that's, that's, <laughs> no, it's not an STD. Um, <clears throat> Gerbs, I think, is short for some sort of pyrotechnic. Gerbils, maybe? I, I don't know. But, um, yeah, I, for some reason, I was able to memorize his solos for the most part, um, which is, it's always good to be able to play the solos of the person you're replacing, and if they're playing it, you know, like the record. Um, I mean, there was obviously some stuff that I, I pulled out of my butt to, you know, because I forgot it, or it's just like blues licks. <clears throat> but for the most part, I, I was actually proud of myself that I, I memorized his solos, because I, I usually don't do that. So, um, as you can see on, on most of the songs, I just kind of wrote the keys or the key centers, or maybe even the, just the first chord. Uh, and then on the left side, I, this, these were the tunings of the guitar. So this half was all just kind of E flat standard. And then we did like a drop C sharp, drop D basically on that one song. Then we switched to three songs about, uh, that were in low C sharp tuning, um, which were, you know, the Slipknot song and two Stone Sour songs. And then back to E flat. Thank you, it's newbie, I see that. Let's answer your question so I can stop talk, <laughs> talking about the set list. Uh, glad you took a live gig. In the spirit of live performance, what is your personal favorite live failure? A favorite live failure. And how did you recover? Here's some cash because they probably didn't pay it. <laughs> Thanks, dude. My favorite live failure that I've, that's ever happened? Oh, God. I, I mean, you... By saying favorite, it's not that I liked failing at this live, but there were some intense situations. I remember um, a couple of years ago when I was touring with Thompson Square, the, the country artists that I was working with, uh, we were playing an Austra a festival in Australia and my something in my pedal board shorted out and I lost signal. So in the first song it was something was seriously wrong so basically i played the whole show telly right into the um i think it was a vox ac30 which sounded great but you know i didn't have any delays i didn't have any overdrives boost i didn't have a tuner so it was that was scary because you know i i hate to say it but i rely on that gear for that particular show and that particular set list um, and so when your, your sound changes, it definitely affects your mood and it definitely affects your playing. So that was a hard one to get through. But then again, like how often do you get to 
play a guitar straight into a cranked amp. So it's just a matter of playing around with the volume knob to get my clean sounds and, and really digging in. So it was a little bit different, but that was the one that stands out as a, as a gig, you know, failure, I guess. So there you go. Thank you for your super chat. Um, so what happened? What, what were we talking about? Oh yeah, the set list. Boom, boom, boom. Um, those are, you know, just certain notes. Um, and I got through it. These notes were good. But, uh, so Wednesday. Thank you, Basil. Basil. I say Basil. How might your prep have changed if this was a super iconic band like Guns N' Roses, for example? Well, it wouldn't have changed. I think it's likely that it would have been easier because I'm more familiar with a lot of the Guns N' Roses catalog. Um, I mean, if I was given a day to learn songs and prepare for a Guns N' Roses gig, it would have been the same pre it would have been the same pressure. Um, yeah, I don't think I would have done anything different. Cause, of... but um, yeah, it was it was definitely high pressure. So I, I magically learned and memorized. That was the important part. I memorized the songs in in a day, <clears throat> and then spent the the rest of Tuesday packing, changing strings. So the guitars that I brought on this uh, run, it was just a run. I, I say tour in quotes. It was just a run, two shows. Uh, but I will say, and I will say, I will preface this that if you don't, if you're not familiar with me, um, oh, Chris R. Before I forget, I don't want to forget all your super chats. I appreciate it. Thanks for the afternoon hang. Any tips for stage presence while playing? I obsess over hitting the right notes and look like a robot. Yeah. Don't obsess over, over that stuff. You just got to loosen up um you don't have to constantly look at the crowd or anything i don't look at the crowd that much um but i do move around i make sure i move around i i'm animated or whatever it is you know match the other band members don't try to go over the top if if all the other band members are not going over the top so i like to fit just fit in man albus band I learned the gig. Oh, good! You learned my uh, the Catlin Bread Gigius riff. Really wish you hadn't thrown the ring finger, in, but I got it. Glad you got back out there on the stage. Thanks, buddy. Good to see you on here. Um, well, back to Chris R. The stage presence thing. I guess. I mean, it took me a while to get used to all that stuff. I remember playing on live TV for the first time. I was terrified, and you can, you know. I, Luckily, it's not on YouTube, and luckily it was just on Spanish morning sh TV. But I looked super scared and like awkward and like I did. I just stood in one place. So, you know, after years of playing out and you know touring and <clears throat> playing with live bands and and playing with cover bands and even you know you don't have to be playing with big bands or huge artists or going on tour to have. To learn how to work on your stage presence. I mean, I worked on my stage presence playing, um, you know, uh, Jesse's Girl at the Irish Bar. I'll be honest, though, I mean, like, a couple drinks definitely helped me loosen up. So just don't go over, over the top on that. But, you know, if it helps you loosen up and, and you can still play, you know, 100%, then, you know, whatever you got to do. But just, uh, it's, it's more about just being relaxed and having fun. And then that comes out in your stage presence and, and you know. It does feel awkward at first, though. Totally agree with that. Um, Alan's guitar channel, did I use my own amp? No. So, good question. I knew that was going to come up. Uh, everybody's gear was pretty much backlined because this was like a last minute booking. Um, so they didn't have their normal gear. They didn't have their normal, um, tech boxes or anything. It was kind of just, um, 
Uh, everything was backlined. I, I got a JCM 800. I think Christian got a JCM 800 and a Fender Super Reaver or a Twin Reaver for a clean sound. He was A being his, his dirty and his clean sound. Um... I think that's it. But yeah, JCM 800, and I would set it to um, edge of breakup. I didn't, I, I think the preamp knob was, you know, under three or four. It was not totally dirty, but it wasn't obviously totally clean. Um, before I forget, so this week was a big week. This past week was big for me. Number one, it's it's been three years for me since I played any kind of live gig. If you don't know, it, at the end of 2018, I quit touring altogether to concentrate on this YouTube channel. So, um, we're at 19, 2019, 2020, this year, no live gigs. Just sitting right here in this in this chair for you for the past two and a half some years. So... That was exciting, but also scary because I, you know, hadn't played with other musicians or in a live situation in front of an audience in so, so long. But I wasn't super worried about it. I just wanted to make sure that I could still do it. And then B, number two, is the it's first time traveling and flying and socializing with people in over a year for me. So that was a new, that was kind of part of the high pressure was like, oh, I'm getting on a plane now. Uh haven't been to the airport so it's totally different now and but that didn't that actually didn't stress me out because i was so you know concentrated on knowing the show so the flying situation and all that stuff i didn't you know worry about <coughs> um but the guitars that i brought if you're wondering if you haven't seen the photos uh this was the one i brought for my e flat standard beautiful nags keen eye this is just like my rock and roll guitar it's stays in tune great sounds killer trustworthy probably one of the best touring guitars i've ever used as a single cut double humbucker i.e les paul style guitar jason lindholm what's up man thank you for your super chat jealous playing with Corey taylor had had played first open jam uh, with old bandmates in over a year Sunday. Awesome. Have videos on Facebook. It was glorious. Isn't it great to play with other musicians? Shade Hope. Well, we're talking about it. What axes did you take? Back up. So glad you got the jam live. Thank you, Shade. Thanks for the super chat. So this, I only brought, I didn't bring a backup. I brought two guitars. A, because I was flying by myself, so I had to carry all the gear myself. Um... And I didn't, I couldn't carry more than my pedal board, which I'll show you in a second. And then a, two guitars and a double mono gig bag, which is heavier than hell. <clears throat> I just get another super chat. No. Okay. Sorry, Mr. Taco. So this was my E flat standard guitar, which I used for most of the set. Didn't, and it didn't break a string. Awesome. And then for my, the Slipknot and the Stone Sour drop tune stuff this one charvel jakey lee which you've probably seen on the channel uh and if you don't know the story behind this this used to be christian martucci's and i traded him my 1980 les paul custom silver burst for this um and so when i brought it out i took it out of the gig bag i'm like hey man remember this and he's like nice how's it treating you and all that stuff so it was cool I think he thought it was cool uh, that I was using it. Uh, and it sounded great. He's like, man, because when he was using this with Stone Sour, he was using it in E flat as a, a standard tune guitar. So he never used this in drop C sharp. Um, but we both agreed that the, this pickup, which I can't remember, he switched it out to, I don't remember, wish he was here. Um, but for drop tune stuff, this pickup, is really great because it keeps the attack and the presence. It doesn't get mushy. So props to whatever the Seymour Duncan pickup this is. So this was, these were my two guitars. In the case that I would have, something went, you know, 
guitar stopped working or I broke a string, Christian had backups. So between him and I, there was a backup. There's at least one backup for each tuning. And luckily we didn't need to uh, use those. Um, I think he brought out four guitars. I'm gonna show you a bunch of cool stuff in just a second. Arthur Gonzalez, I don't wanna miss your super chat. Thank you, Arthur. Um, I'll be with one of the big new metal bands Saturday. Nice. Uh, I'll definitely bring my nag, Steve Stevens guitar, which I've been looking at. Um, I've been actually looking at the Severn X, the with the whammy. Uh, I love that monster of a guitar. I love the live shows happening. Great, man. Well, enjoy the gig this weekend. That's exciting. Um, a lot of people, a lot, a lot of my friends are are finally getting out to play shows that I'm seeing. Um, I know a lot of people that have been playing shows since March. I know, uh, I think Corey's been playing. They've been doing a tour since March or something. Um, Oni das Alagoas, the MG Music Red Amp, uh, it's the Sky Dog. It's the low watt Sky Dog. I can't remember. I think it might be like a 10 watt amp or something. Um, what was I talking about, y'all? Okay, guitars, pedal boards. I don't know if LPD is here. So this was my pedal board that I put together in a day. So this this temple board obviously has seen some some stuff. This was my board, the actual pedal board that I used for five years playing with Thompson, touring with Thompson Square, the, the country band that I was <clears throat> playing with. So it's all beat up, but it still works. And the reason why I like touring with the Temple stuff is because they seem to be lighter than like a pedal train or other, you know, regular boards. Um, it's only, you know, it, it's not, it might be a pound lighter, not even a couple ounces lighter. But when you're flying, it definitely makes a difference. So that's why I, I stuck with this. Um, I've got a Chox pedal power um, dual locked to the underside, to the undercarriage. And then, you know, with these temple things, they have these modules that you can plug in your power cables um, or run your ins and outs through the side so you're not, you, you know, so it's all organized, that's why I love this one for touring. And I didn't really have to bring a lot of stuff. Really, <clears throat> I could have gotten by with just a tuner and, and one overdrive for the gig. Um, but there was one song, the fir very first song, Highway 666, where there's tremolo in it. And I literally grabbed this one, the, um, the Jam Harmonious Monk, because that was what was here on my main smorgasbord. So I'm like, I'm just gonna, Take it, it sounds good, it's easy. Um, B Thalco, I'll, I'll, I'll get to you in just a second. Um, other pedals, can I zoom in here? Yeah, here we go. Tuna, this one, small tuner. You know, I don't like, especially for flying, if you don't have to take a big tuner, just bring the smallest thing that does the trick. So the Polytune Mini, TC Electronic, <clears throat> the Maxon Apex 808, I just needed like a tube screamer to tighten up things. Cause you know, when you're playing like heavy, you know, distorted stuff, when you put a, a, a tube screamer or like, I think Christian was using a boss, uh, super overdrive, super distortion, um, just to tighten things up. That's just what, you know, you do with the metal stuff. And then, the star of the show was the LPD 87 Deluxe. Um, really, I brought it. I brought it just to be, just in case, because I wasn't sure if I was going to use the distortion on the JCM 800, which I didn't really do. Um, and then I had, you know, you basically have two channels, two amp sounding channels on this thing. So I basically used a red, you know, a red side for the most part. Um, and then I would tighten it up with the the Maxon. But it worked great. I like having just a simple pedal board. This was probably the smallest. No, I mean, Corey didn't really have a pedal board, but 
That was the smallest pedal board on my side of the stage. All right. Don't want to think. I don't want to forget. B Falco and ST. Uh, love my temple board. Do you just use the board or do you use the threaded plates for your pedals as well? Good question. I stopped using the threaded plates just because it limits how, where you can position things. So I just throw on some Velcro and or dual lock. And when I have to switch it out, I just tear it off or rip it off. Uh, and it seems, to, I mean, it's held, you know, it lasted the week, you know, being tossed around the, the festival backstage and everything. So <clears throat> dual lock is the way to go with all pedal board stuff. Yeah, the threader plates is a cool idea. And obviously that's part of the whole temple board uh, product, but it was kind of a pain in the butt to me. But with, I mean, <laughs> you can see all the paint is chipping off. I've done things where I've used like uh, zip ties to go through the holes to strap down pedals. But, you know, you can see I have like a spare strip of dual lock just in case. <clears throat> ST. I have enjoyed you playing for a while now. Glad to see you playing out. Thank you, ST. I appreciate the super chat. So that was the gear. Um, I traveled with the two guitars, my board. I have a, a 50 foot long loom that's left over from my, my country touring days. And that has three quarter inch plugs. So an in and out, and then I have a spare, luckily, and then a, a long, long power cable for the pedal board. So that way, you can put your cables into the board and wire it all the way to the to the back line so it's cleaner um, and it doesn't get all tangled and whatnot. <clears throat> I didn't have a wireless, so they actually rented me a wireless uh, the first day of rehearsal. And um, it did cause a little bit of problem um, switching between the two guitars with a wireless pack. Um, sometimes I would switch to the Charvel <clears throat> and the, the RF frequencies would hit the uh, the wireless unit and cut in and out. And that actually happened the first, that happened uh, in rehearsal, in the rehearsal, and then it actually happened during the first gig. Luckily, we kind of knew it might happen, so we had a spare cable. Um, it didn't happen at the festival, magically, thank God, because I, you know, it was a, a bigger stage, which I'll show you in a second, and I would go out on these, you know, catwalks, and um, it didn't cut out at a festival where everyone and their mother is using a wireless or a cell phone or something. So I don't know. The gods were with us that day. Um, what else? So I, t I showed you the... Um, I'll show you the pictures. Um... Well, you know what? Let me see if do you guys have any questions before I, I show you the the photos of these shows, or maybe even show you video of of some of the shows. Did I do my little dance on the catwalk? <laughs> I did. I did a little dance. I threw. I think I threw out one or two picks. I only brought like five picks with me, so let's see here. Maybe do a brief recap about the gig for those who joined late. Um, I played with Corey Taylor last week. That's my brief recap. If you wanna, after this stream is done, it'll be on my my channel for replay. Cause it's a long uh, intro. <laughs> there's, a, there's a long background. Um, so I think I've got some photos I can share with you. Hey, close up on me. So, I don't know what this, what order this is in, so this is gonna be weird. Okay, so Corey Taylor, if you didn't know, pl plays Novo guitars. So he's he's down with Novo, he's down with Dennis Fano and everyone at uh, Novo. So he was playing, except for the acoustic, all Novo guitars. And he, I asked him how many he has now. He has six Novos. Um, I think the Voltour is his newest one, but yeah, it was really cool. Um, he's a Novo fan. 
I think the story is they were in Norway during this one of the Stone Sour tours, um, and there's a big guitar shop in in Oslo. I forget what it's called, but they they were a Novo dealer, the only Novo dealer kind of in the EU or something like that. But um, they had a Novo there, and I think that's where he checked them out, and you know, got more and more. He he digs them, man. I like him too. I was considering bringing my Novo Crockett, but you know, for this type of gig, it's that's not what it's suited for. Corey can play it because a lot of his parts are just strumming with overdrive or distortion. For me, I had to have humbuckers and and tight you know, guitars, so that's why I didn't... Maybe I need to get a, a metal Novo, like a, a Novo with a humbucker that's kind of set up for more metal stuff, actually. Okay, that might be the next Novo, guys. You heard it here first. So, okay, this was uh, Corey's rack, which I was jealous of, but it's good to see him playing Novos. Um... Okay, so the first show we played, Albus Band, I don't know if you're here still, Aaron, <clears throat> it was a place called uh, The Rave in Milwaukee, which uh, is one of my favorite venues. I, I got to play there with Stone Sour in 2018. Um, and it's an old, old building from, I don't know, the early 1900s. It was kind of like a gentleman's club, not gentleman's club, like a strip bar, but like a you know, like a country club type of atmosphere. It's been so many different things. Clubs, I want to say it was like a hospital for injured vets. I don't know. Anyways, super old building. There's three stages, three clubs basically in this building. The very, very top one, which is the biggest room, which is the Eagles Ballroom. The main floor, which is the Rave, which is where we played. And then there's like a bottom basement venue. Roma! Man, I'm gonna have some good tacos tonight. Thank you guys. Doing this live stream thing must be super weird at times sitting there talking to a screen, but there is a lot to learn from your experience. Thanks, man. Keep them coming. You Have you been on my Saturday live streams? So normally I do a Saturday morning live stream if you're just tuning in. My normal live stream is always Saturday, 9 a.m. Central Time. Obviously, since I was traveling last weekend, I couldn't do it, so this is my new live stream for this week um and we'll pick up again bc rich looks haunted well let me tell you something it is extremely haunted but i luckily um there's a lot of stories i mean aaron albus band if you're here you can tell everybody about this block really <clears throat> so the ambassador to hotel the ambassador hotel on the left side that's where jeffrey dahmer used to stay and his very first victim they say was in the ambassador hotel i don't know i can't remember the story but i think there was a a, a dive bar around this block that he picked out his first victim and i think you know did the do did the 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 duty at the ambassador hotel so that that hotel is probably haunted but um there's you know there's folklore with the this venue the rave eagles club the uh the basement is the most haunted spot there is an old old indoor swimming pool there which is said to have said to be probably the most haunted space. But then I heard that there's something underneath there uh, where like the boiler room is and all this stuff, which is, you know, that's definitely the most scary part. <clears throat> the first time I played there, our dressing room was literally next to the, the swimming pool. They even had like a window peering out from the dressing room uh, into the swimming pool and you could go into the swimming pool and, and hang out and take pictures and all that stuff. Uh, I walked in there, I was in there for a couple seconds and I was like, nope, I'm out. Um, and also 
I had to take a shower in the basement by by yourself. That's kind of a scary thing. The first time is extremely scary. The second time I was like, whatever, I, it's <laughs> whatever happens, happens. I guess I was a veteran. So um, that was the rave. Uh, I think I have actually photos of the show. So this is, I, I probably stole this off of Facebook or Instagram. I, I, I can't give credit to the photographer, but um, I would give, give credit if I could. So this is, you know, a decent sized club. I believe attendance was 13 or 1400 people. So it was a decent sized uh, rock venue. Um, not as big as the upstairs, but you know, when it's tight quarters like this, it's a lot more fun, you know? Um, just cause it's a, it's a cooler situate crowd. It's a cooler crowd band interaction when it's this close together. <clears throat> Dex Rangoon, I've never played with Richie Kotzen. Uh, I've met him though in LA. I have my, my buddy used to play drums with him. <clears throat> Next picture, uh, let's see here. Okay, that's another shot. Instagram that must have been from Instagram. These are all from Instagram um, So at, at the Milwaukee show since it was indoors they didn't do pyro or any kind of special explosive explosive things, so I Didn't get that stuff until the next day, so it was kind of unexpected but um, cool lighting CMFT uh, That's basically the name of his new album. I don't know if it's the name of his new project Corey Mother Effing Taylor is the name of is his latest album. Um, and I think the single CMFT is almost like a quasi rap. He gets um Tech Nine to to rap on it. Let's see here. More cool lighting. I should I should, you know, say I think that was the house lighting. <clears throat> so they did a really good job of arranging it really um quickly when it's you know it's when it's not your typical lighting rig you know good good lighting designers uh can work with anything so they're good okay so here we go next day was uh friday so that was the festival day which was rock fest uh in kadat wisconsin and that was a four-day Festival starting on Wednesday. So it was Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, Saturday. Wednesday, first night, it was uh, Queensryche and Slaughter. So the the more old school metal bands played on Wednesday. <clears throat> Thursday, uh, Rob Zombie, Stained Anthrax, Fozzie. Uh, th this is the main stage. So, so there's a main stage. There was like other side stages and other tents. So I couldn't tell you who... I mean, there was tons of other bands playing in different areas of the festival. Uh, so Friday was co-headlining uh, Limp Bizkit and Corey Taylor, Phil Anselmo and the Illegals. Sorry, Philip H. Anselmo now and the Illegals. And then uh, it was actually supposed to be of Mice and Men. I'm not totally familiar with that band, but they dropped out and they pulled in Night Ranger. Night Ranger, everybody. So they, I got to see Night Ranger. Uh, and then Saturday, we had already gone, but Saturday was Korn, Danzig, Chevelle and Body Count, and some other bands. It's great lineup. Um, I should preface this saying, this was uh, a last minute add to to their tour, Corey's tour. Um, originally it was supposed to be Limp Bizkit and Snoop Dogg. Snoop Dogg canceled at the last minute, so uh, they got Corey, luckily. Um, so that's how it went down. That's why it was kind of like a last minute gig. So anyways, uh, I was excited to see Night Ranger. They played in the afternoon, uh, like four in the afternoon. So we spent the whole day at the venue. We had to load in, or the techs had to load in at, at 9 a.m. And we didn't play until like eight or nine. So we were there the whole day. Um, I hadn't gotten much sleep uh, that day, the previous night, so I knew I was going to take a nap at some point. Well, 
I think I got up. I think I might have actually taken a shower. There was dressing rooms with showers, so that was nice. Um, ate a little something, and then I went back to the, the bunk on the bus and, and took a nap. And I woke up. Um, I get a text f f from Christian Martucci. That's how it always happens. <laughs> I never get to his text until I wake up. So I woke up to a text that was basically like, uh, Brad Gillis is in our dressing room, or Night Ranger is in our dressing room. I think our, our backstage dressing rooms were right next to Night Ranger. And uh, Corey, Corey knows everybody in the business, in the, and he knows Brad Gillis and Jack Blades from Night Ranger. So obviously, at some point, they were all going to meet and hang out. And I wanted to be there for that. I just wasn't sure when it was going to be. I just assumed it was going to be later in the day. So I took a nap. Well, guess, guess what? I missed the whole hang. I get a text from... Uh, Christian, where is it? He got to hang out with Brad Gillis, play his number one guitar. If you're not familiar with this guitar, then leave right now. No, I'm just kidding. This is, you know, not only all of the Night Ranger stuff, but this was Ozzy, uh, I wanted to say Shout at the Devil, Speak of the Devil live album when Brad Gillis did basically did kind of what I did and 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 you know was the ringer after Randy Rhodes passed away he was the guy that filled in for the rest of the tour <clears throat> I'm just kidding Chris R this is Brad Gillis Brad Gillis's famous strat if you saw the video where I react to his his instructional video and his gear this is the exact same one so this was what I wanted, this was like my plan for the whole day was, I want to meet Brad Gillis and the rest of the guys in the band, but I also want to see if I can just hold the guitar or just look at the guitar, and my buddy Christian got to do it. So, I was, <laughs> needless to say, I was kind of pissed off. Not pissed off, I was jealous, because that's what I wanted to do, you know, meet Brad and, and check out the guitar, and... Apparently, you know, if you don't know much about the guitar, yeah, no more sleeping during the day. That's, can't let that happen anymore. If you don't know about this guitar, this was a 60s Strat that Brad did so much things, so much stuff to it, obviously put a, a Floyd Rose, which I believe that's the first or the second Floyd Rose ever made. He painted the neck and headstock black, uh, changed the pickups out, uh, I don't even know what's in them anymore. Duncan and the bridge. Yeah, a bunch of Duncan stuff. And I think, you know, he back in the day, he installed a wireless system in the body of the guitar. So he didn't have to wear the pack. And to what I heard from Christian is like, he's still using that same wireless, which, which would mean he's using a wireless unit from the early 80s, maybe even the late 70s which I don't know if that's possible, but um, yeah. And all of, all of that uh, scratching from, you know, above the uh, pick guard is from him using metal picks because he's known for using metal picks. <clears throat> and side note about the, that Floyd Rose, that old school Floyd Rose. If you don't know Brad Gillis is playing, he uses the Floyd Rose a lot. Almost overuses it, but I saw him using it so much and his guitar would not go out of tune. So I, I'm extremely interested in the old school Floyd Roses because I have never seen another guitar player use the whammy bar as much as him and as aggressive, I wouldn't say aggressively, but you know, there were wide dive bombs and you know, a lot of it. <clears throat> and it, I think he had that one, and then he had a backup one, which was identical, pretty much. Um, and they wouldn't go out of tune. They didn't go out of tune. So, yeah, exactly. Well-known Floyd abuser. Probably the most well-known Floyd Rose abuser, but I was extremely impressed. I don't have video of it. I think I, I might have posted it on my personal Facebook, but uh, Corey actually went out and sang uh, part of Don't Tell Me You Love Me with them which was super cool. Um, so yeah, I didn't meet Brad Gillis, but 
I did sneak into their uh, their trailer after they had gone, and I got I got their set list. Just this was like the only thing that I I for the memory, you know. I'm like, shoot, I couldn't touch the guitar. I couldn't meet Brad Gillis. Well, I'm gonna steal a piece of paper so I can remember uh, their set list, which is shorter than I expected it, but it's all the hits, you know. Coming of Age, which was a surprise because that's a damn Yankee song. So it was, I didn't know that they, they played that in the set. Um, and then you got, you know, Rockin' America to Sister Christian closing out with Don't Tell Me You Love Me. Killer. Um, and then after them, Phil Anselmo, Philip H. Anselmo and the Illegals went on. And I believe their whole set was all of Vulgar Display of Power. I think it was just that album top to bottom was their whole set. I think. Okay, that's me. So this was a shot that I guess one of the staff photographers uh, from Rockfest took. Um, so if, if you're a Spinal Tap fan, you'll know that my shirt, that's like my favorite um, shirt to wear for rock gigs, is my exact inner structure done in a t-shirt. <clears throat> um, so there's me, that's the nags. And I finally, finally found some uh, photos of some of the pyro. Uh, I'm clearly not in this photo, so I must have been on the catwalk, the stage right catwalk, shredding, or <laughs> actually, I, I, I'm gonna, I'll be the first to admit, I definitely had many clams on this uh on this gig a part partially because i couldn't hear at the very beginning this was one this was one of the first gigs i've done in a while of this size without in-ear monitors normally when you're playing big stages most bands are are in ears you know the wireless pack and then you got your earbuds or whatever not on this this run um I think they're actually, they might go back to going to old school wedges, which, I mean, I probably haven't done an, an old school wedge festival gig since I toured with a reggae band, Inner Circle, which would have been like 2004 or something. So it's been a while since I, and luckily I didn't get deaf because they were loud. Between wedges, side fills, and then explosions in back of me, I'm surprised I don't have any hearing damage. Um, so that's a shot, that's a cool shot of uh, the, the stage and some of the pyro. There was pyro and there was uh, flames. I don't know if there's a, yeah, just, they call it flames. Um, this one, I don't know what's going on there. I couldn't tell you what we're playing. That might be what gerbil, gerbils are when they just rain down the pot, the, the sparkly stuff. I am not a, a lighting person or a, a pyro guy, so I don't know the, the terms. <clears throat> but um, I could tell you the first bang Remember, the previous show in Milwaukee was inside and we didn't have any pyro. This show was outside and of course they were gonna use pyro, but we never rehearsed it with pyro. Um, the pyro people didn't rehearse it. Keep in mind, this festival gig, there was no sound check, there was no line check. It was what we call throw and go. Just get up on stage, hope your monitor guy is awesome, which he was, and dial in something that resembles a, a mix for yourself. Um, I, I, I will say that Corey's crew from the, the, the guitar techs, backline people, audio people, lighting people are all number one, pro level. Like I've, you know, I hate to say it, but better than any that I've worked in Nashville with the Nashville touring stuff. These, you know, they know what they're doing. It's not their first rodeo slash rock festival. So, um, 
explosions. Boom, boom, boom. Yeah, um, I think I sh did I show this already? I don't know. Anyways, really cool stage show. There's some, there's pictures of the flames. So the first time we started playing, uh, the first song has a concussion, which is like a loud bang. I don't even know if there's fire or anything, but uh, it's loud. So when it, when you don't know it's coming or when it's coming, I didn't know when they were going to do it. Uh, it, you know, it makes you, <laughs> it gets you scared for one second. And then after the first one happens, then you get like, oh yeah, I totally forgot about the pyro. This is going to be awesome. Um, but yeah, that very first pop scares the heck out of me every time. And it's, I mean, I've, I've been on tours that had pyro and all of this stuff, the concussion, the flames, but it's been a while. So when you're around it, um, Ben Coombs, I'd likely pee a little. It's likely that, uh, something came out. I don't know, <laughs> but, um, uh, what was I going to say? Yeah. So none of this was rehearsed, which I was very impressed with the crew for pulling it all together. Um, cause that's definitely hard work. Uh, yeah, the flames were incredibly not, it wasn't painfully hot, but you definitely felt it, um, on the back of your neck. And I've been to shows, I saw Slayer with these things and you can even feel it in the crowd. The heat just kind of like dissipates like forward. Um, so whenever they shoot them, even the crowd could probably f feel the heat to quote, um, Boogie Nights, speaking of Night Ranger. Um, yeah, I think that's it. I think there's a video here. What is this? Oh, this is a backstage of the, um, at the Milwaukee. Um, this is one of the, the dressing room areas, which I don't know. It's really one of my favorite venues to play. It's just like a cool vibe, really good people uh, that work there. Um, Usually good catering, although I don't think we had catering on this night. <clears throat> but uh, despite the haunted everything, uh, but despite the ghost, it's a, it's a fun hang. So that's that. And then I think I had a video I wanted to show you real quickly, which you can go. And I apologize if, apologize if I'm missing all of your, your comments that I'm not seeing. <clears throat> um... Yeah, there's a video somewhere. You know what? I don't have it ready because my computer restarted. Just just do a YouTube search, I guess. Coy Taylor, Milwaukee. It's it's up there. But um Yeah, that was it. And so came home Saturday, flew home Saturday and um you do get a little, uh, it feels weird doing stuff like this and then coming home and then you have this period of, you know, settling in and deflating and the excitement of the shows and being on the road and then coming home to just my normal life. It feels weird, but it's, it's very good to be home. So if you're just joining us, uh, I kind of covered the, the, how I learned all the songs and stuff, but Dex Rangoon, how long did I have to prep? Uh, I got the, essentially I got the call on a Monday and I had to leave Wednesday. So a day, a day and a half. Um, what else? Yeah, I guess I'll just answer any questions you have. Um, I'll probably, I'll go for another 10, 20 minutes. So if you have any other questions about touring or, or the shows um, or anything else. This is an open live stream Q&A. Do I have the tour bug now? I knew someone was going to ask that. Here's the thing, and um, I kind of knew this was going to happen prior to doing this. I knew I would love playing the shows and playing with my friends 
and the you know the energy that you that you get a high when you're playing in front of a crowd i i wouldn't say i miss it but that's something that i will always love um but traveling living out of a suitcase poor sleep um poor diet i i definitely lost weight last week because i wasn't eating like i normally eat at home which is like a pig <laughs> I I had smaller meals and I, I I ate less frequently, so I I wasn't starving, but I ate less. Um, I don't miss the traveling, but the uh, you know the live playing and the the musical interaction and the hang is the best part. Will I go back on tour? Probably not. Um, but it also depends on the situation. But I'm not, I have no plans on, on, on getting on any tours. But like I say, every week, if the right phone call comes, you know, if the right, situa right situation comes along and it's the right time for me, then sure, anything's possible. Was I able to take my wife? No. I think um, uh, it's kind of like, you know, you don't bring anybody on the trip unless you're the artist or, you know, part of the band um i was just you know fill in situation hired gun so um i didn't even ask about you know uh guest list or anything not that i was going to have any guests or anything but um i don't like to bother <laughs> i don't like to cause any uh stirs or you know i don't like to stir the pot i keep to myself make it easy for everybody I guess that's one of the keys to to these um, hired gun gigs is, you know, just uh, don't overreach with things, you know, trying to get free things or I have a group of 10 people that want to come to the show. Can I get free tickets? All that stuff. I'm definitely not that that guy. Dante five Inferno, my tube screamer settings. It's basically all noon. I mean, there's nothing special about it. That's, I might, uh, I might put the drive a little bit lower and then tweak the level up a little bit like that sometimes. So I'm not getting a lot of sizzle from the overdrive, but it's with this pedal at least, which is one of my f favorite Tube Screamer 808 uh, pedals. Do I do online lessons? I don't. I do have uh, lesson products, uh, courses. Um, right now I only have a slide course, but um, I'm working on a blues course, which is a slow go, especially since I had to leave town, but uh, it's, you know, getting the momentum back. That's the hard part about uh, leaving town and coming back to do your normal stuff is you lose your momentum and you kind of, you feel like you gotta start over start from zero <clears throat> the big green pedal uh is the lpd 87 deluxe sorry it's actually more like a surf surf green thing uh lpd 87 deluxe thank you scott brockaway uh jason lindholm i got a jcm marshall jcm 800 backlined it's kind of the standard you know hard rock amp that you get at most festival situations or whatever. Um, I don't think I could request like a diesel or uh, even like a Friedman or something. I think just JCM 800 is kind of the standard. It's like JCM 800, Fender Twin, maybe a Vox AC30 if you're lucky. That's kind of like this, the baseline of backline amps. Um, <laughs> Black Star, you know what? I I, I haven't played uh I haven't really played a Black Star amp, Sean. I I think I might have tried one out at a guitar center years ago, but you know, I, I have friends that play them. But um yeah, I think you can't go wrong with with Marshalls. 
And like I said, the, you know, I could have gone through a Fender Twin because I had the LPD 87 Deluxe as my Marshall in a box sound. Um, so that was why I, I picked it was because it was kind of like the safe way to do it. You know, just as long as I can get a clean amp, I can have that metal sound I wanted to, to use. Did I play my Nash? No, I was considering bringing Dan Landather, which is over there. But when you're doing these gigs with a, a, a tremolo or a Floyd Rose, it's you're running the risk of breaking a string and everything going out of tune and ruining the whole show. So if I don't have to use a tremolo or a whammy bar, I don't bring it ever. Um, I always bring something that if I break a string, it won't go out of tune, so I can still play, finish the song or whatever. Um, sign any boobs? No. I didn't sign anything. Actually, I don't even think they had merchandise on this front. It was such a, you know, uh, a last minute thing that there was, I don't, usually I get like a t-shirt or something. I didn't get anything. Sean had to use a black star on the warp tour. I could not make it clean. Yeah. Well, that's the same thing with the JCM 800. There's no clean sound to a JCM 800. I mean, if you if you dial the preamp d really low and dial the master really low, you could sort of get a clean sound. But for stage volume, you, you still have to put up the master. And then when you do that, it kind of in turn gives you a little bit of overdrive, so. The weather was actually perfect. I was so thankful. The weather was like 70s uh, during the day. It might have gotten up to 80 at the, you know, 4 p.m. mark. But it was, when we played, it was nice and cool. Um, mind you, this is in, I don't know if it's upstate, but it's, uh, Kadat, Wisconsin, which was an hour east, no, two hours east of uh, Minneapolis, I think. So it's that, you know, that line. Uh, what pickups do I have in the Nags? Um, not your typical heavy metal pickups. Well, this came with a Duncan... 78 so it's like a custom shop seymour duncan 78 which is kind of like their early eddie van halen pickup <clears throat> and it came with this guitar came with a a duncan jazz in the neck which i replaced with a duncan um slash neck because i really like the slash the alnico two uh sounding slash thing in the neck um so as a Les Paul style guitar, this is a little chewier sounding. Um, like the this bridge pickup has a little more honk than just a standard, even like a super distortion or you know a hot, medium output humbucker. It has a little more character, which is interesting. <clears throat> All right, a couple more questions, ML. Um, I prefer tube, tube amps playing, especially with the rock stuff. I just have to have the, the tube stuff. Opinion on the Helix type pedalboard processors? I think they're great for certain gigs. I don't own one. I own a Helix rack, but um, I know a lot of guys that do a lot of touring with the Helix floor, um, but I don't, you know, I'm kind of old school. I would rather just take my amps in a pedalboard. <clears throat> So, five more minutes. I don't think I actually have any... Well, maybe I do have amps on. Can we hear it? You guys want to hear some... Less of me yapping and more of guitar things? Oh, all my picks are gone on tour. I 
I probably haven't picked up a guitar since Sat uh, Friday. <laughs> Uh, one of the, I can play you one of the solos I had to learn. Uh, I forget the chords. It's uh, it's in uh, one of Corey's songs called uh, Black Eyes Blue, which I believe was his first single. But uh, the solo that I had to play was really cool. I think it went like. And I was learning this pattern, and I'm like, this is very familiar. That pattern, which is not a typical pattern, but it reminded me of something. And today, just today, I was having a conversation with some friends on Facebook about Jeff Watson's Don't Tell Me You Love Me solo, because we were talking about Night Ranger. And that's the pattern from, from Don't Tell Me You Love Me. So what I was playing was what? The Jeff Watson solo for Don't Tell Me You Love Me, which I can't play up to speed, is like... Ah. But that pattern... I'm sure it's in other songs as well, but... I figured out that pattern was the same kind of fingering as as Don't Tell Me You Love Me. Uh. Something like that. Anyways, um, Carrie Kelly is the uh, the stage right guitarist now in Night Ranger. Or he's been um, that guy. I think Joel Hoekstra was the previous one, and he and and Carrie Kelly was nailing those solos. All of the eight finger stuff, like. You know, all that stuff, which I could never play in my life. He was nailing that stuff live. And I'm like, wow. It really, I mean, that's definitely a hard chair to fill, like a hard, you know, position to fill because those Jeff Watson solos are not easy, you know? The, the, the Brad Gillis stuff is a little bit more approachable, even though it's a lot of, cool whammy stuff, but it's also very technical. Um, it's a little more accessible. For me, it's a little more accessible. The Jeff Watson stuff is like, you know, you might as well be playing like Stanley Jordan stuff. Ben Tom is here. You're late. Or, or have you been here and I just haven't been paying attention? All right, guys. Um, unfortunately, Saturday, um, I have a house guest this weekend, so I don't know if I'll be... Well, we'll see. We'll play it by ear. Maybe I can sneak down to the studio and do a quickie live stream. But Saturday is, uh, is, is up in the air. But um, it was cool to be able to do this evening uh, live stream. Hopefully my friends in Australia and New Zealand and the Philippines and everywhere, you know, in the future, are, were able to uh, have fun. And if you don't follow me on Instagram, IG, I posted a lot of, st I mean, in my stories while I was gone last week, I, you know, I posted a bunch of behind the scenes things that were happening. So make sure you're following me on Instagram so you can see what I'm doing in the moment. Um, all right, guys, Pete Bialk, later on, man.
Live live guests, yeah. That's one thing I used to do. It's just so hard to... Maybe I'll start doing live guests during a midweek live stream because it's a little bit easier for, you know... My, my Saturday morning live stream is a little bit too early for a lot of people, so they don't want to be guests because they're still, like, in their pajamas. But uh, maybe I'll start doing, like, a Tuesday or Wednesday evening, 5 p.m. Central Time uh, live stream. So, all right, guys. Um... This has been cool. Uh, thank you to Ben Tom, Ben Coombs, Matt Harrison for for moderating. If you have any questions, and I apologize if I missed a bunch of your comments because I don't have my iPad and I couldn't see hi highlighted th things. Um, if you have any comments or questions that I, I failed to answer, Make sure you leave them down below in the comment section, and I'll try to answer it uh, tomorrow. But uh, yeah, let me and also let me know, you know, if a Tuesday evening like this live stream works for you. I was thinking more like a Wednesday kind of hump day, you know, midweek thing. But uh, Tuesday or Wednesday, I could figure something out. Um, actually, Tuesday might be better because Wednesdays I usually have to, to, to work all day and sometimes a little bit later. So maybe this will be a thing. What, what should we call it? So if, if Saturday is our Saturday coffee q and A, I I don't want to, I would, I don't want to do Tuesday something. Tuesday, taco Tuesday. I would have to get some tacos every Tuesday. <laughs> And just eat tacos in front of you guys. Taco Tuesday Q&A. Something like that. Tuesday Taco Q&A. Could I make that happen consistently with tacos instead of coffee? <laughs> Tuesday Blues Day, Mitchell is saying. Ben Coombs, Wednesday would be better for me. Okay. Taco Fun Tuesday. We'll figure we'll figure something out. It might not happen next Tuesday, but this is this is cool because it gives me a chance to to check in with y'alls. All right. Uh, thanks again for hanging out for as long as you did. Um, enjoy the rest of your week. I will let you know by Friday if I'm doing a Saturday live stream, uh, but we'll see. Don't fault me for not doing it a, a second weekend in a row. All right, guys, uh, enjoy the rest of your week. Enjoy the rest of your evening. Joy Koi. Joy, Joe Koi, out.